The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, let me remind you where we stand and what we're going to be doing from now on. We're, I think we're going, to we're going to be spending increasing amounts of time looking at extended passages from selected programs, and we're going to sort of jointly analyze them, both from a cultural and what we might call a literary or an aesthetic perspective. In order to, and, and, we'll, and again, we're going to jump back and forth between those two perspectives as we, as we continue. One of the things that I think you're going to begin to recognize, uh, and I'm even thinking about making at least one question on the final exam like this, although I haven't decided for sure whether I'll do it, is I think you're going to be able to get to the point where when you look at a program, you're going to be able to tell by its visual style and by its uh, audiovisual atmosphere what era it's from. And that will be a mark that you've learned a lot in the course. That will be a mark that, you're, that, you, that, you, that in a certain sense you control a way of understanding what's happened to American television over its 50-year history. I'm sure you already have begun to do this, and I hope you're testing your skills in this way on television broadcasts themselves. One, one, thank you. One neat, one neat way to do this, one neat way to do this is to uh, tune into one of the cable channels that specialize in older programs. And without looking in your Brooks and Marsh, watch the program and ask yourself, gee, what, what, what decade was this in? How close can I, can I gauge when this, when this program first appeared? And I, I don't, of course, imply that this is merely a technical question, because what makes this an interesting kind of problem is that very often the substance of the program, the content of the program, will also be revealing, although learning how to distinguish those things is a bit more complicated. But I hope by now you've begun to do that. Uh, at some point fairly soon, we'll post, uh, I think you can actually find this on the course website already, but we'll post a systematic list of all the viewing that you've done on Wednesday nights. And one thing you, every, every one of you should plan to do is go through that list, think through that list. If you've missed some of the viewings, try to make it up by, by uh, making arrangements with Mickey Dupree to see those programs. It's, and, and of course, read the Brooks and Marsh entries on each of those programs. You, what you'll find is that a good many of the, of the essays I've required for reading in the course deal with the programs that we've been showing on Wednesday nights in our viewing time. You should reread those essays or read them for the first time if you've neglected to read them yet in order to deepen your sense of those programs. If you connect your viewing of those programs with the argument of the course, I think you'll see, uh, uh, you'll, you'll be much closer to mastering this kind of, I, 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 this, the, these, these strategies of reading, these forms of attentiveness that can help you date a program, that can help you, uh, and when you're able to do that, what you're also, of course, uh, showing yourself is that you, have, that you have an historical understanding of the way the medium developed. So the themes, uh, so, the, so the fundamental theoretical premises of the course have been established already. And if you're in doubt about some of them, go back and reread. Look at the essays that have been uh, assigned for the course. It's a, uh, by now a very tiny selection of the vast body of material that's been written about television. Uh, but it gives you a reasonable cross-section. Uh, the, the reading is distorted in one sense, because it's distorted toward my perspective, which I'll call a kind of aesthetic or cultural perspective. There are powerful ideological or, or uh, political perspectives that, but I've, uh, that, that are probably, one might actually say that those perspectives have dominated the emerging television scholarship up to now. But I think that's beginning slight, somewhat to change. Uh, uh, and in any case, I've given you in some of the readings a, a sampling of, the, a, a, of that kind of discourse as well. Uh, so it's not as if I've excluded that. But I have emphasized what I think of as a kind of literary and cultural approach to the medium because I think it's the most appropriate and the most encompassing. As I define a literary and cultural approach, it does not exclude political or ideological questions at all. It simply does not obsessively focus on, the, on those elements to the exclusion of everything else. And there was a there, there has been, I think, in, in uh, literary scholarship, in anthropology, and of course in this emerging territory of, of media study, especially of television study, 
a profoundly, ex a deeply excessive emphasis on the ideological and the political. And there are a lot of explanations for that, which we needn't go into now, but I'll be glad to discuss with you at some future point, not in class, because I don't want to interrupt the momentum of our mm. discourse. So the basic theoretical and historical parameters of our understanding have already been established. And in this final, what is it, about a month and a half of our course, what I want to do is look at, continue a kind of chronological sequencing of the material that we, that we talk about. Uh, but I, I, I want to sort of, in a certain sense, focus on specific moments, specific passages in individual texts, and see if, as a communal project, we can uh, join in a kind of uh, interpretation of these, of these materials that will help us to deepen and, and complicate our understanding of the historical and, and thematic development of American television. Uh, um, so, so I want to begin then today by, by uh, uh, taking a step back and showing you a passage that I'm remiss in not having shown earlier. There was a moment in uh, two or three classes back when I brought this tape with me, intended to show it. Something happened. I think I, think I, I, think I, I, I took longer on one, on one aspect of my discourse than I expected, and I had to eliminate it. So I'm, I'm stepping backwards. And, and the reason I'm doing it is I don't, I, I, want, I want partly to kind of complicate uh, even the paradigms that I've offered you. I think they're sufficiently complicated. And, they're, and if you understand them properly, they don't oversimplify. But it's possible to understand them in an oversimplified way. For instance, our basic model of understanding the history of television is one in which uh, a, a kind of simplicity and imitative novelty gives way to a technical complexity and then to a complexity that joins technical and structural complexities to a greater attention to serious substance. Right? And I think that that pattern is accurate. But it's very important to recognize that all cultural and historical generalizations are just that generalizations. And there are always, there are always, con there is always some amount of contradictory evidence that someone could cite. And I want to show you a piece of that contradictory evidence from one of the great, what, what I think of as one of the most important programs of the 1960s, uh, as a way of indicating to you that even in, even in the relatively early, in this relatively early phase of television, uh, the early 60s, there were certain co programs that could mobilize uh, uh, complicated subject matter that could that could uh, that could uh, uh, project uh, notions about the society that were less than simple-mindedly reassuring. Remember, our basic idea is that again, remember the consent the notion of a consensus medium does not imply that all the consensus medium does is project a very simple kind of propaganda. And if you think about it, the propaganda becomes much subtler if it's able to acknowledge dissonance and contradiction. If it's very easy to be reassured about the basic uh, social order and about the beneficent uh, 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 perspective the social order wants you to have on, let's say, uh, uh, on, the, on the national government or on the basic structures of the society. It's very easy to project such, to offer such propaganda if the propaganda never acknowledges problems. But if the propaganda actually acknowledges, gee, there is racial turmoil in the society, nonetheless, let me reassure you, overall, we have a, we have a society that can, that can uh, adjust wrongs and, and right injustice. So that uh, one way of understanding this, the, the point of a consensus medium is not to suggest that the consensus medium is never capable of acknowledging defects and difficulties in the society, quite the contrary, and that it's most complex uh, usually uh, uh, in moments when the society itself is under some kind of pressure or tension, the consensus medium of a society, I think, plays a crucial role, a, a crucial social or political role in, in holding the center together. I think that's the role that American television played in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, especially if you compare what was happening in the novel or in the movies to what was happening on American television, you can see what I mean about a consensus medium that is nonetheless capable of acknowledging something of the complexity and turbulence of the outer society. And we've begun to talk about this matter and looked at, uh, talked about some of the programs before we're through with our, with our class discussions. We will look at fragments of programs from that era and later in order to see, it, to see these principles in action. So this, tech, th this uh, fragment I want to show you is is a fragment from a, a, a television program from the early 60s that we've mentioned a number of times in the course. And uh, you've already seen one, what I think is probably the best single episode of this, of, of, of this program in, our, in your Wednesday night's viewings. It's a, it's a, 
uh, a passage from The Fugitive, from David Jansen's uh, The Fugitive. And uh, pardon me while I struggle with the technology here. And again, I'm showing it to you as a way of indicating that there was, even at, the, at this relatively early moment, shortly after the triumph of movie assumptions about fiction, right? If, uh, if we think of the late 50s as the period in which, in which the Hollywood model came to dominate how we thought about what television fiction would be like, this relatively early 60s show uh, shows how fully those principles had been absorbed. Uh, it's a Quinn Martin program, and Martin was one of the first to realize that if he could deliver to to the American household, the illusion that they were sitting in their living room and watching movies over the small box, they were getting something great. Uh, uh, and he, he, he refined these principles in many programs that appear in the 60s and in the early 70s. But, but in terms of substance, in terms of intellectual power, in terms of uh, creating a, a genuinely powerful fable of American experience, I think there's no question that the fugitive is far and away Quinn Martin's most important program. It wasn't his most successful program in terms of ratings. And it wasn't the most successful QM program in terms of longevity. But I think it was the most important program in terms of substance. And the episode, uh, the fragment of an episode I'm about to show you is a scene that occurs in the episode that was shown as the first episode in the series. It was not, I think, intended originally as the first episode, but for a variety of reasons they broadcast it as the first episode. And it's a scene that uh, uh, comes about halfway through the program. Let me set the context for you before I show it. Uh, it's the usual basic pattern of that, of that program. The, the, the um, fugitive is on the run. He's an, he's an escaped convicted murderer. And if he's caught, he's going to go to the electric chair. So his, so his, so his flight is a, is a survival uh, uh, adventure. Uh, and, but, but of course, uh, and again, this is another way of recognizing the relative, uh, still the relatively early uh, stage this program appears in. There is something uh, un implausibly noble about the, the character that David Jansen plays. Uh, and uh, what this sets up is a, is a, uh, a drama in al almost every single week. The drama, the, the program mobilized, was a drama in which Jansen's conscience as a decent human being, as a moral person, and sometimes, often, especially his, his conscience as a pediatrician, as a doctor, because, uh, uh, would, be, would, be, would be put in conflict with his need to survive. He would come across some injured person. And if he actually showed that he had medical knowledge and could fix this person up, he was risking exposure. And almost every episode confronts Jansen with some such kind of crisis. In this first uh, episode, uh, first broadcast episode of the program, that's the problem that's set up. It's not a distinctly, it's not, a, it's not an exactly a medical prob problem. He, he, Jansen takes a, a job in, a, uh, in a, uh, a, a western city. The title of the episode is Fear in a Desert City. Uh, and he takes, a, he takes a job as a bartender. And by, by the usual accidents that come to define this series, he befriends a woman who works in the bar who it turns out is separated from a violent and brutal husband. Uh, and she has a child. And the fact that she has a son who's, you know, I, don't, I forgot his age, he's 10 or 11. Uh, but he's not an infant, but he's not yet a, uh, an adolescent either. He's just about to enter adolescence. And one of the things that Jensen is drawn to, it comes out of his pediatrician's interest in children, is the fact that the boy is in need of a father, and the boy is in need of a more stable home. Uh, and, the, uh, uh, and, and, and that's part of his motivation in, in, in befriending this woman. So, uh, and it's, uh, and uh, he does, he's very reluctant, I mean, as, as is often the case in The Fugitive. Uh, the Jansen, Jansen's heroism uh, uh, is almost never a physical heroism. And that's another reason why it's such an interesting program. It's a moral heroism in which he, he uh, over and over again, will risk exposure in order to protect himself. And in fact, in the episode you saw, one of the reasons that's such an interesting show is that what we see him risking himself uh, uh, t uh, dramatically uh, it, uh, because he wants to help the very man who has been pursuing him so relentlessly for for all these years, and it even and there are other episodes like that. Although this one is my favorite, in which Lieutenant Gerard, who's been who's been uh, tracking him forever, uh, is thrown into contact with Jansen, and Jansen is forced by the necessities of the plot to intervene in some sense on behalf of the man who is his deepest nemesis. There's a sense in the program 
that if Gerard disappeared, Jensen would be home free because nobody else in the universe cares about his not being around except for, except for this obsessed man. And as some of you may realize, the program is based on a famous novel by Victor Hugo, broadly, Les Miserables. And then it's also another thing that grants it a special kind of complexity. It's also based on a famous real murder case uh, in which a doctor was alleged to have murdered his wife. Uh, and it was a you know, front page news all over the United States for uh, an extended period. Uh, and I think, in fact, that the, that I'm not positive about this, but I think one of, the, one, of a, one of the country's most famous lawyers, Lee Bailey, was involved in the case in some degree. It was a, so it was a very famous case. And the, and the show, the, 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 the program, The Fugitive, is partly based on that. It takes, takes advantage of, alludes in a way, to that, to that uh, uh, public memory. Of that, of, the, of that famous event. So in this, in this fragment I'm going to show you, the woman has already befriended Jansen. And uh, he very reluctantly, as, a, as he always is, he's reluctant to, um, to, to uh, uh, intervene in, 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 in helpful ways in the lives of other people because he's on the run and he knows he doesn't want to risk exposure. But he's reluctantly drawn into it because his decency and his conscience require it. And, and in the sequence you're going to see, he's, uh, Jansen is uh, escorting the woman. I'm calling him Jansen. It's Dr. Richard Kimball is escorting the, the woman who has asked for his help to a taxi cab. And he's actually about to get into the cab with her when the police show up. And the police have been sicked on it. We don't, I don't know that you learn this from this episode, from this, from this segment, but the police have been, have been alerted to Jansen's presence. And still, they don't realize that he's the fugitive uh, by, the, by the estranged husband who is jealous of the conversations that his wife has been having with this. what you have. How do you like your job, Lincoln? Well, he hasn't seen much of it, but he likes what he has, correct? You know what? It's funny. Something funny? Well, I guess I mean, uh, strange. An average man, uh, if there is one walking home, and, and the police pick him up for questioning, what's your name, where'd you come from, etc. Et you know he's scared. Is that right? Well, I never knew that. Did you know that, Fairfield? Now, why would the average man be scared of the police? Guilt. I guess there isn't a man in the world who doesn't have something he wants to hide. Even you two. Now, that remark was not calculated to gain favor with me. I'm sorry. I guess these questions are just getting me a little nervous. You know, Sergeant, you are pushing me around. Uh, gently, but pushing. Put yourself in my place. I'm a stranger in town. No one to vouch for me. No friend who's a lawyer. I can't demand a thing. I just have to sit here and take it. I wish I could argue with you, but you know you're right. I wouldn't want you to think I was sadistic. It goes on like this, but we'll stop it here. Talk to me about what you've seen here. Make some observations about it. Start any place. What's interesting here? 
I think, in fact, that one thing about this episode, this fragment, is that it might, you might be misled by it. Because uh, I think if I watched it cold and had never seen it, knew nothing about what it was, I might date it later. I might, I might put it later in the history of television. I mean, that, and that's, but talk to me about what you see. Susanna. Well, I thought it was very interesting. It surprised me a lot because it's, it's questioning the character dynamics, the sort of genre assumptions of police interrogations. I mean, that, that last line, I wouldn't want you to think I was sadistic. Well, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking, of course, because that's the assumption I make about the bad police vil villain who pulls the innocent man into his car. It's, um, and the calmness of his responses, that wasn't calculated to gain favor with me. It, it seemed interesting. It seemed to have a sort of, of um, metal level questioning of the genre going on, which intrigued me. Maybe. I think, I think there's something to that. But I, but, uh, but, but I, think, I, I, mean, I think you're right. Uh, but the, I think the crucial matter isn't its relation to the genre. Because remember, the fugitive is a, is a kind of is a skew genre anyway. It's not, it's not a perfect genre text. Uh, because it's not really a cop show. It's not really, in other words, it doesn't really exactly belong to the traditional uh, generic arrangements we know from the movies and from television, although there are stories about people on the run. Uh, but, but I think you're right, of course. It does raise certain kinds of questions about the legitimacy of authority. Wally, we'll start with you. Well, it's, uh, it's come down like this. Then Max, then okay. Kevin. I played, it, it has, there's, the dialogue itself is delivered very slowly. I, I mean, Kimball, Kimball's lines were actually were aggravating to me because I was waiting for the next words to come out and they wouldn't. And it's and the the characters are the characters are speaking slowly, but it's cutting very quickly between them. It's cutting between a reaction shot from the guy in the, and the guy in the front is kind of sitting there. You have no idea what what his deal is. Uh, he just gets these sort of creepy little reaction shots watching them in the back. It's cutting between the sort of the two shot with Kim on the foreground and switching back and forth. And at the same time, there's there's music underneath with no with no pulse. And with no theme, that's sort of, that's just sort of uh, meandering and providing a mood. So it's building tension without actually doing, nothing's going on, and yet you're constantly sort of the tension's being ratcheted up by sort of juxtaposing the the sort of the scared movement of the camera in a sense with the with the unnatural snow, slowness of the way that they're. Okay, I mean, but, but you say nothing's going on, but in fact, it, why is it a scene of tremendous tension? I mean, when it, I mean, what, what, there's sometimes in the episode, sometimes in the fugitive, you have the fugitive being forced to walk into, let's say, bus stations, and sometimes even, uh, you know, courthouses. And very often he'll walk past bulletin boards that will have a wanted sign on it that will have, that will show Dr. Richard Kimball. Right? So, but when he's brought into, and of course, and of course, one of the series' favorite devices for creating tension is a version of what we see here, Jansen in disguise, in in his in his in his. Uh, 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 in his fake identity, whatever it happens to be for that week, is put in contact with cops who, if they knew who he w was, would immediately arrest him. And I mean, you know, he's in a certain sense he's caught here. And I think that's what, one of the reasons that that the camera uh, uh, behaves as it does. And I, I think I think you're calling attention to crucial elements of the scene. But I think there's more. We might want to draw out some some of some of the implications. In terms of substance of what of, from what you said, Max, what, what did you have to say about this? Uh, I was very impressed by the realism um, of of it, um, also by the intelligence of the uh, Kimball character. Um, he, he's trying to maintain a facade of being someone different, um, not being a fugitive, and um, he's put in a very compromising position. And I think the dialogue is very intelligent um, in revealing how uh, Kimball is aware. Of how he can maintain that facade. He he's scared. I mean, who he he needs to kind of explain why he's scared. Why would he be scared if uh, he if he doesn't have something to hide? And uh, I think that um, uh, it's it's very aware of a situation that it's believable that um, uh, uh, the Kimball character would say what he's saying. Um, Absolutely believable. It, and 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 there's another point about that that I think is very important. About one of the things it's doing by giving. Kimball, that kind of dialogue, is it's generalizing the program. What is it saying about the relation between ordinary people and authority? <laughs> There's a kind of, even, even, even people who are not guilty feel guilty, are frightened. I mean, and and, and, and uh, this might not seem a very uh, shocking or disturbing thing to say over American television in 1975 or in 1985. But in 1963, this is a very shocking thing to be, for, the, for this new consensus medium to be saying. <laughs> Uh, and in that sense, it's a very subversive scene. It's, it's, it's before its time, in a way. 
it, 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 it reveals a, a more complicated and, in many respects, subversive or skeptical attitude toward established authority, and especially toward the police, than is common on television in this era. It's not a reassuring treatment of the cops at all, is it? And when he says, do you think I'm sadistic, it's almost as if he's made it too explicit. I might complain about that line, Susanna, in part because it, make, it, be, it makes him say what, in fact, we've seen. And one of the things about the scene that I find so impressive is that it is an exercise in sadism, but it's, but it's not physical at all. It's psychological. Right? That, co that, that actor is a wonderful character actor who had many, many roles on television. Anyone know his name? Harry Towns is his name. And uh, uh, when I, in, in one of my trips to Hollywood, uh, when I went to see Quinn Martin, uh, I interviewed, he was very flattered that a Yale professor was interested in his programs. He was a very vain man. So I played it up. You know, I, I, I sent him a note on Yale stationery, and I, I left him a message so he had to call Yale back so that when I went out there, he thought he was talking to Yale. He didn't know I was leaving for MIT the next month, but we'll, we'll leave that aside. Uh, he might not have been as impressed. I don't know. <laughs> in any case, well, I, when, I, when I went out there, I spent a whole afternoon from about, uh, about five hours at, at the QM studios. And, and uh, uh, two-thirds of that time with Martin himself. And he had arranged, uh, so, so he gave me an interview, a very long, elaborate interview, in which I asked him various questions about what he was up to. And I was, I was impressed by his understanding of the technical nature of what he was up to, and not that impressed by his awareness of the substance of his programs. He seemed, he seemed in many ways less interested in the substance than in the, than the visual flash. And it was revealing that that was true. We're at that moment in, in, in television history when the visual flash is important, where the medium has become a film medium. The, medium the, the fiction television has become essentially a film medium, and Martin's one of the people who's figuring out how to make it so for the reduced visual scale of television. Good. I, and, you know, not a, uh, but one of the th uh, most interesting things that happened was wh wh when I, he had arranged for me to, he had arranged for a screening of an episode for me. And this was an era, of course, before uh, the advent even of the video cassette recorder. Uh, and so it was actually a much more complicated matter. I, when I first began to teach television at Yale, I taught for, I, I, I used to tape some things off the air using reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And I would bring these elaborate big reel-to-reel -reel tapes and, then, uh, and, and show them to my classes. And it was, so it was at a very relatively early stage, and it was hard to get hold of material. So, so uh, uh, he, he arranged for a screening, and I was really, also, most important, of course, there was no market for video cassettes in the, in the there were no video stores. So it was hard to get hold of things. I mean, once a program had been shown, that was the end of it, unless you could see it in reruns. So I was grateful for the chance. And he showed me this episode, the one, I, the one I, whose fragment I've just shown you. But, in, but instead of leaving me alone, as I expected, he sat there with me as we were watching it. And he made commentary as we were going through it. And one of the things he talked to me about was casting and how he had cast particular actors to play the, to play the role of these cops who seemed physically unimposing but were capable of projecting a kind of menace in their attitude. And he even thought, so he was aware of this, uh, and, and fully aware of the extent to which the conflict, the, the confrontation between, or the conversation between Harry Towns and David Jansen was a, con was a profoundly unequal conversation in which what increased its power was the fact that Towns is physically so unprepossessing. He doesn't look like a, mu a, a muscle man. He doesn't look like a violent person. Uh, but Towns, I think, brilliantly, played the role brilliantly, because you could see that he was enjoying the power he had over this fellow, uh, that he was, in a, in a certain sense, uh, reveling in the fact that he could, that he could make him uncomfortable. And he was abusing his power as a cop. There was an element of psychological sadism in that scene. And I think it's very, very powerful, very, very persuasive. Uh, 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 and, and I think what Max says about the Jansen character is exactly right, that, that we're aware, it shows that how, how how even from the very beginning of the, of the series, the that this series understood the principles of its appeal, understood the, ground, the, the grounds of its, of its, of its, um, of its uh, uh, difference from other programs on television and, and, and dramatized those meanings very early. So what it establishes then is a situation in which in every se subsequent episode, every time Jansen comes near to having some kind of relationship or, or, or encounter with authority, there's the possibility that authority will misbehave, that authority will be unfair, that authority. I mean, even if even if the social order were totally noble and all, and all cops were fair and, and and honorable, Jansen would be in trouble because he's a convicted murderer, even though we're assured that he's innocent in the very beginning of the program. Uh, 
in the in the in the title sequence. Uh, so we'd be, we'd we'd be confident of that in any case. Uh, 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 that 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 he, that even even if the cuffs were were all decent sorts, Jansen would have problems. But the possibility that the cuffs are not such decent sorts, and that the folks in authority in general, and especially the police authority in the society, might have sadists in them, might have people who are not very not very responsive to sort of ordinary strangers who come into town, is a powerful statement to be making. And again and again, the program dramatizes how tough it is to be a stranger in a. In an, in an American environment, how, how much different it is, uh, how, 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 how insular American communities are. Again and again in the, in the series, Jansen finds himself forced into a relatively insular community, a community, let's say, sometimes the communities are of particular kinds of workers, right? Steam fitters or miners or, or uh, 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 in, 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 in some in some episodes in some episodes uh, Jensen gets jobs that are somewhat connected to his medical expertise but indirectly so so for example there's one early episode in which he is a, a trainer for a boxer a cut man right? uh, uh, and so there's a community of the community of boxing there's a, and and almost every episode involves some exploration of these communities almost always almost always uh, these communities are insular places, reluctant to accept uh, strangers. And, and J part of Jensen's problem is finding a way to gain acceptance. Gaining acceptance in that community is doubly hard because if the authorities are called in in any way or are, are involved in any way, Jensen is vulnerable and, and uh, in, in, in trouble. So there, there's, a, there's a kind of tension built into the situation and, and an implicit critique of the social order built into the subject matter. But yeah, let, let's continue. Kevin, you had some things to say. I was just going to say that uh, this segment, more than, more, than, more than the episode that we saw in class, reminded me of uh, sort of the, the, the film noir tradition, uh, perhaps the, the sort of the, the lone, the common man against the, uh, the perhaps corrupt authority figure, right. uh, sort of harkens back to uh, the Chinatown. Uh, sort of the move. But harkens forward to China. Oh, oh I mean, China harkens China is much later. <laughs> <laughs> harkens forward to the 1970s. Chinatown is 10 years down the, yeah, down the street. Yeah, correct. Into right. Chinatown. Uh, sort of uh, the, the, the mood, the music, uh, the dialogue, very uh, subtle. Um, uh, uh, not, unlike some of the other. Yes, and in fact, I, mean, I think you picked up on an important, even an atmospheric quality that was characteristic of many of the episodes. A lot of them were not, uh, a lot of the episodes were not primarily shot in daylight. Uh, and the shadows, the, the, the noirish shadows that are natural to nighttime, are re reinforce the sense that Jansen is a is a man is a is a is a furtive, frightened fellow. Uh, Wally's comments earlier about the way Jansen was speaking might have uh, implied this, and we might want to make it explicit that Jansen is a magnificent mumbler. Uh, and the reason is, it's, it's obvious why he speaks that way. That's a psychological, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of how layered his character is even from the very beginning. Uh, and Max's comments about the reasons for why Jensen is having problems talking, but has to come up with some reason to explain his nervousness, and then of course comes up with the, with the, with the most persuasive and, and plausible explanation of all, a true explanation, which is all of us are nervous when cops come up to us and say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, um, uh, what, what this suggests is that even from the start, the show had a kind of psychological complexity, at least in part, uh, that uh, was unusual for its era. Uh, but again, I don't want to exaggerate, I don't want to carry this too far, because it is not the case that every episode of The Fugitive was an astonishingly complex, rich work of art. Very often the plots were implausible, very often there were, uh, the, the, the best elements of the program were obliterated in, 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 in scenes of violence or, or unnecessary physical uh, uh, energetic adventure, action adventure kinds of kinds of scenes, and sometimes uh, the show, often in fact, the show yielded to certain other kinds of common cultural fears. But at its best, it mobilized the kinds of ambivalent, complex feelings toward authority and toward and, and toward uh, human interactions that the sequence we've just looked at um, does. And there's more to be said about it, though, even especially in a technical sense. First, Sajan. What I think, though, the truly wonderful thing about this is that it seems to me the refreshing thing with Kimball is he's such a modest character. Um, you know, everyone places value on a character's strength, and a lot of people mistakenly look for characters to have that manifested aggressively in some way. And Kimball, when you look at him talking, he's just kind of trying to reason his way out of the situation. And there's very few characters, even on prime time right now, I can think, who have that quality. It's Jim Rockford and Bill Cosby 
have that quality, but very few other actors. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's a very interesting comment. I think there are other examples, but I think you're right that there's a there's a vulnerability and a, a nonviolent quality to the to Jensen. And, and in fact, he carried these qualities over into the wonderful detective series that he appeared in in the early 70s, Harry O, where he played a, he played a detective who was profoundly nonviolent uh, and who, like Rockford, got his way by wheedling and by and by uh, 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 personal interactions rather than by rather rather than by physical uh, uh, strength by beating people over the head and so forth and uh, and I think it is a quality that's characteristic of, of of this actor that he that and we do feel it strongly I think in this fragment yes in the back um, I don't really think that being nonviolent or being modest is something that um, necessarily adds to the you know artistic nature of the character or the series. I think that, you know, there are a lot of works that are very ultra-violent that are just as valuable as pieces of art. That well, I, I don't think the implication of Sajin's comment, and I certainly no intention of my comment to say that, that there, were, there was some reason to believe that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that characters like Jansen or, or, the characters, or the character played by Jim Rockford were uh, inevitably superior to the to the more to the more active characters, but I think there I think the, I think there is something to be said for the idea that uh, the macho tradition of action adventure tends to create a situation in which the hero is valued for his ability to smash people's faces in, in right? Uh, and one can see it in the movies very powerfully uh, uh, in the, the sort of the sort of the sort of Rambo type hero. I think you could mount a very strenuous argument for the idea that the Rambo type hero is is a contemptible kind of kind of uh, ideal to hold up uh, as something to be uh, uh, admired or or, or 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 imitated you solve problems by violence you uh, you're profoundly inarticulate uh, years ago I, uh, there was an article in the New York Times about the this is a, a comic parenthesis that some of you may be amused by there was an article in the New York Times about the uh, importance of the Rambo type uh, movies, and especially about what's the name of the star who plays Rambo, Sylvester Stallone, and and it was partly about Stallone. And uh, the author of the article called a number of film and media scholars around the country and asked for their input. And uh, some of the people he uh, this reporter called praised Rambo and praised the emergence of a new kind of uh, action adventure uh, here, uh, program. Very powerfully. But I was called as one of the media experts, and I mainly said I, I thought that Rambo was a contemptible ideal, and that in fact that there was a deep sense in which he was an anti-intellectual figure because he, he, was hostile to our, he was hostile to words. He was, his inarticulateness went to the point of even seeming to celebrate a form of unthinkingness. After the article appeared, so I attacked him. I was almost the only, uh, there must have been a half a dozen media scholars who were quoted. It was a very long article. Uh, and. Uh, I, about, about three weeks after the article appeared, I received a letter from Sylvester Stallone in which, he said, in which he said, I want to thank you for understanding me so deeply. It's so nice when a literary critic understands my work. Uh, I thought that was a confirmation of the fact either that he couldn't read or that his agent had made a mistake and misaddressed the letter. <laughs> <laughs> because this might have been an appropriate response to one of the other people who had commented on him, but I was very negative about what he, what he stood for. But go ahead, come back. Well, I just think that, you know, that the, the position that you take has been pretty popular over the past couple of years, that, you know, that this sort of, you know, super strong um, embodiment of physical bravery is and sort of anti-intellectualism, that this is sort of contemptible. But I don't think, I don't think that that's really true, and I don't think that even now that we're seeing that that is a valid point of view, especially in light of September 11th, when you didn't have Yale professors running down to the World Trade Center. You had physical bravery, like inarticulate, stupid firefighters and policemen running down there and being not contemptible, valid heroes. Well, I don't, why are you calling firemen inarticulate and stupid? I mean, do you have evidence for that? I mean, I, the, uh, the firemen and cops I know are not always inarticulate and stupid. The issue is not whether physical bravery is admirable. Right? And I mean, you're misunderstanding me if you think I'm suggesting that physical bravery is itself something contemptible. But have you ever seen a Rambo film? That's not about physical bravery. That's about, that's about insane, absolutely inconceivable survival against machine guns and bombs. 
He's not a he's not a real he's not he's not even a remotely plausible character. I mean I mean he survived he survives a, a, a nuclear he could survive a nuclear explosion, given you know, what what the, what uh, and of course it, what it, what what the Rambo films and films like them celebrate is not physical bravery exactly. What they what they what they what they, what they celebrate is the is is solving problems through force, uh, and and uh, they create they they create a notion of a kind of superhuman power to survive. Uh, uh, you know, uh, machine guns and other uh, and, and and other kinds of uh, violent attacks that no actually vulnerable real human being could survive. It's no part of the argument that I've been making, and it was not implied in anything that Sajin said that to value uh, intelligence and to value gentleness uh, uh, is to denigrate physical courage. That doesn't follow. And so I, mean, I don't think you're being fair. I mean, and I agree with you that physical courage is something to admire and is something valuable. In fact, in this series, Jan the Jansen character shows physical courage many times, but he never shows an impulse to sort of beat up on people because it's fun to beat up on them. And he never shows an impulse to sort of uh, use physical force when there are other ways of dealing with a problem. He's incredibly reluctant to use physical force. Uh, that seems to me a much more admirable and heroic position than the position that says, okay, uh, um, when in doubt, throw a punch. When in doubt, pull your machine gun out. Right? And that's what we're quarreling against. I mean, I think you're right about physical courage. And uh, you know, if you remember, uh, uh, my man Romano said something about that when he was here talking about what he thinks has happened after September 11th, talking about how the values of physical courage seem to be uh, you know, more available to us, more, more, obvious, more obviously worth thinking about. But th the only place... With, where I would disagree with him is to suggest that it has never been the case that American popular entertainment has been short on violence or short on physical courage. Where it has fallen short is in dramatizing forms of gentleness, forms of, especially in the, in the male genres, in the action-adventure genres. So it's reasonable to recognize this as, an, as a significant quality in, in, the Jansen, in, the, in the Jansen performance. Yes, um, yeah, Robin, push your microphone. It, it represents a complexity of character that you don't see in a character that may only emphasize one one side, be it strength or be, you know it's, it's like the vulnerability offers a chance for illumination you know within the dialogue that you wouldn't get from a character who who represents only only one side of of that spectrum from strength to kind of gentleness. So I think that you know Sanjay's examples of, of Rockford and Crosby and. And Jensen, in this case, they all offer a, a rich complexity of character right. that, I think that's that true. lends itself to the narrative, that, that, that guides the narrative, really. Right. right. Yes. I was just sort of wondering how this conversation is, is, um, is, 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 is sort of complicated by um, characters like Sipowitz on NYPD Blue and shows like The Sopranos, which, ha which, which, uh, which seems, I don't know if they rely heavily on violence, but they have, but they definitely include in they do rely heavily. Is a, they is do a rely heavily part on of the violence. show, but are also very complex right. and very and have yes, very that's rich true. characters. I, 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 look, I think you're pointing, you're pointing to something very important, which is that the treatment of violence itself, how violence is understood and dramatized is the crucial question. It's not as if violence per se is something one would never want to see in popular entertainment, but how the violence is, is dealt with, how violence is understood uh, is the crucial question. And you're mentioning Sipowitz, the hero of what television program still running? NYPD Blue, what, which in its early days, it's, it's been running for a number of years now. When it first appeared, I think it was one of the subtlest and most powerful shows on television. And, it, and in some of its early episodes, among its most interesting subjects was exactly the question of the relationship between, well, of the cop's responsibility toward the question of violence. And there were actually some very powerful episodes in which the, the protagonists of the program would, as they put it, tune up a, a witness. Let us say they take the witness and they, they threaten him with violence. They, 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 they might even knock him around a little bit, but they certainly threaten him with horrendous violence to force a confession from him. And there, in the early episodes, in the first couple of seasons, when this happened, there was actually a kind of discussion of it, a debate about it. And, and uh, uh, the, 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 the cops who did it, the, the, the police who did it, obviously were, were were aware of the extent to which they were transgressing certain boundaries that were inappropriate to transgress. And they felt, and they said, well, I do it very, but they, they acknowledged that they did it, but they said, I'll do it very rarely. I hate to do it. I know I'm violating the Constitution. One of the interesting things that's happened to American television, to violence in the cop shows on American television in the last 
five or six years, and certainly in the last couple of years, has been this kind of violence has become much more common, and the cops haven't apologized for it. Uh, and in fact, uh, this has happened on NYPD Blue, where, where it, it is now a kind of, in, the, in, the, in a recent episode of NYPD Blue, which was broadcast after the September 11th catastrophe, they have one of the cops lean over a witness and say, a lot's happened recently. It was clearly an allusion to September 11th. And I got no more patience. We're busy. We got other things on our mind. You better confess. And the guy doesn't want to confess. And this man who's twice as big as the witness grabs him by the throat and seems as if he's about to choke him to death and forces a confession out of him. But uh, in that episode, there's no apology for it. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure how we would read that. I mean, we might read it simply as a revelation of the way in which certain police behave and not act as if maybe, well, maybe the program is not endorsing such behavior. But I think that's a stretch. I think, I, and I think one of the issues that has always been implicit in, in American forms of popular entertainment, not just television, but the movies as well, in, uh, with regard to violence, has been the way in which violence committed by figures of authority is taken to be legitimate or valid. And one of the things that distinguished the early episodes of NYPD Blue was the way it, prob it, it put that into question. It problematized that issue. It dramatized that question. Uh, there was a wonderful early episode in which the, uh, uh, the, one of the lead protagonists, uh, David Caruso, who left the show after a couple of years, has, a, has a, a young cop, a kind of neophyte cop, who's his partner, who's just learning the ropes. And the young cop is full of idealism. And he sees the Caruso character tune up a, 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 a suspect. And they get into a kind of argument about it. And the Caruso character then expresses essentially the ambivalence I've described earlier. That seems to me a much richer and more honorable way to deal with that question than simply to act to, to dramatize scenes in which you see the police threatening witnesses un until they confess. And it, it's a recurring issue on NYPD Blue as well as certain other uh, uh, cop shows as well. The, so, so, the, 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 and so therefore, to sort of try to put at least a momentary closure on this question, although it's something I hope we'll come back to. Uh, before our semester is over, the, th the question of violence in general, and specifically the question of violent activity, uh, not necessarily gunfighting, but, but uh, especially physical violence, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat kinds of violence uh, on American police shows is a critical question. And you can actually see alterations in the, pro in the attitude of programs toward this question roughly calibrated, roughly correlated to the larger society's attitude toward these kinds of questions. So in eras when the society is very impatient with, with, with um, devi what it ma imagines to be deviant behavior, or when it feels under, under attack, as we do now, there often is a spate of, of, of programs that begin to celebrate forms of violence by authority. And I, I predict that, that you're going to see that now, that, that the cop shows and the spy shows on television are going to increasingly show a kind of righteous violence against malefactors, which will express presumably psychologically somehow uh, America's resentment and anger over, over the attack against it. Uh, but but such, such behavior by, uh, by the popular media of a country is part of a, of a much larger cultural process that I hope our discussion in this course has at least helped to begin to illuminate. But look, let's come back one more thing about this, uh, that this fragment of, of uh, the fugitive that you've not mentioned, although it's been implicit in what some of you have said. What about the space in which the film is, the film in which the drama is enacted? Now, to me, that's one of the most significant sort of televisual facts about it. In other words, remember one way: if you're trying to evaluate a pro, uh, if you're trying to evaluate a, a narrative text of any sort, whether you're looking at it in the print medium or in the or, or in a, an audiovisual medium. Or, or you're talking about an oral narrative, if you're trying to evaluate a narrative text, there are at least two basic large territories you need to pay attention to, large problems or questions. One is substantive, has to do with the content, how complex, how rich, how honorable, how, ca how careful, how plausible, how serious the content is. Right? In other words, the, con the substance, what the, what the story is about, you measure that in some degree against your sense of the complexity of the world. And you say, look, if the text is a complete reduction of everything we know about reality, it's limited in certain ways. But if in some ways the text reflects something of reality's complexity, something of reality's reality, then we say, well, that's, that's a virtue. That's a good thing. There's a, so there's a substantive dimension, like what, what we might think of in a narrow sense as the content. right? 
Then there's a technical or a structural or a formal dimension. And the, on the best texts, of course, they always have something to do with each other, and the formal decisions reinforce and strengthen the content. And when you discover that, you're discovering one of the marks of a work of art. A work of art is an act of intelligence. An act of intelligence would, intelligence would, would dictate that if you're working in a particular medium, you should know how the medium functions, and you should exploit the particular, natures of the, uh, particular nature of the medium and avoid doing things that the medium is not so good at. Right? So that if you're making a television program, you don't really try to do the sinking of the Titanic, right? which they did in the era of live television, because <laughs> for obvious reasons. Not just that the television screen is small and down, but for all kinds of technical reasons having to do with the nature of the sets on which the television program had to be filmed and uh, had to be broadcast, the fact that it was live so you couldn't correct glitches. And if it was live on a soundstage, how could you actually recreate anything like the complexity? Compare that sinking of the Titanic television program if you could ever see it. Uh, I don't even know, know if kinescopes of it are available. I don't think they exist. I think the show is gone. But there are a lot of descriptions of it. Remember, I, I mentioned to you that it was broadcast a second time. It was such a success that it was broadcast a second time two weeks later. Compare that to the recent Titanic movie, and you can get something silly as that movie was. It was extraordinarily plausible as a, as a visual experience, wasn't it? And that, that had to do with the fact that movies are made for that sort of large-scale epic expansiveness. Right? So from that technical standpoint, what observations could we make about, the episode, about this fragment of the episode, Max? Um, well, uh, I was thinking about what Wally said, how uh, it was building tension between going um, between uh, the characters pretty quickly. Um, and uh, I was thinking about how they're using close-up um, very effectively. Yes. Uh, the uh, Jansen character, you can um, you really feel somewhat of an intimate connection with his fear because you see it right in his face. When you're right up next to him, you see the cop who's kind of looking back somewhat suspiciously and the interrogating cop who kind of has the sadistic look on his face. Yes, absolutely right. In other words, what this show, so one thing is it uses close-ups in a televisual way. It understands the power of the close-up and the usefulness of it. What else? So it's uh, uh, related to this. Wh where does the action take place? In a giant meadow out on the ocean? Inside, inside, a car, inside an incredibly confined space, even more confined than a room would be, requiring, in a certain sense, the sorts of close-ups that you say. Why does that work? Well, it would work. It, it might work in the movies. You might feel the claustrophobia just as much in them. And there, are, there are some wonderful scenes inside cars in movies, but it's an especially appropriate environment for the television program, isn't it? It's as if, uh, uh, it's as if the people making the program had thought in a systematic way about uh, not, not only about what spaces would be appropriate for their drama to play itself out in, but also what spaces would be appropriate for the nature of television. And that's so in other words, there's a, there's a technical intelligence in the sequence that we've seen that you would not find in, in television five years earlier. And in fact, is, in its fullness, in, in the way that technical decisions are related to character and psychology, and something of, I might make an argument, something like what Max has just said, what you're looking at is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a program in which there's a real relationship, a, a, a real enriching, supportive relationship between the structural decisions, the formal decisions that are made, and the content of the text. When you see that, you're looking at something that's artful. right? When you, when you see the absence of that, you're looking at something that is artless. Well, one of the things I want to do is demystify this notion of art. I mean, maybe we should just use the, use, use the term intelligent text, uh, t intelligent work as against unintelligent work, or effective as against ineffective. I don't want to, I don't want to sacralize the word art. Uh, that doesn't seem necessary. But the point is, whatever category we use, we can recognize the excellence of what's involved here. Two more comments, and then we'll move on. Susanna. I just sort of want to raise the question, the, the distinction here between the idea of um, a work being full of art or intelligence because it uses a certain kind of aesthetic and a, a work being art, artless or without intelligence because it uses a, uses a different one. I mean, isn't it I didn't say that, though, Susanna. Be well, fair. I didn't say it uses a I, different aesthetic. I said it had no aesthetic. In other words, well, I said I'm trying to be fair, but isn't, has, a isn't text it in which there's a connection, some kind of connection between the formal decision and the content is what we're talking about. The Certainly, particular is it, is connection. It's conceivable, for example, to think about how to use the space of television, come to the conclusion that, for example, trying to shoot large open spaces is a good way of using it, and do that, and, and to create a text which has thought about it, made a different aesthetic decision, but is not necessarily without intelligence or thought. 
I'm not exactly clear about what, what you mean. I don't mean to suggest, I certainly agree that we wouldn't want to say that the only good television takes place in taxi cabs or, or hospital rooms. Or small but, but I also do spaces. not want to deny the fact that it is not an accident that the, that the dominant genres that have developed on television are interior genres. They're hospital stories and situation comedies. They take place in domestic spaces. They're, they're urban crime dramas instead of westerns because the narrowing, tunneling spaces of, of our urban lives, are, of urban life, are more appropriately photographed for the television screen than elsewhere. So I think there is a connection between the kinds of spaces that work on television and the kinds of spaces that don't. But I certainly wouldn't want to claim that every, that, that, it, you, that, that a television western would be foolish a priori, that we couldn't have a good western. I try to talk about some of those questions in the essay that I've given you about Lonesome Dove, where I think there's a, Lonesome Dove is a remarkable, in many ways, very, very nice film, although it's imperfect. It has many wonderful things in it. So, so I, I, I don't mean to, 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 to uh, articulate a kind of um, exclusionary aesthetic, which says that certain kinds of possibilities are absolutely ruled out. Of course not. And if that's your point, I certainly agree, and I think it's an important corrective. I could certainly imagine uh, a, a television program on the reduced visual scale of television that even dealt with aspects of expansiveness and largeness in a certain way, although it would require great intelligence and tact and delicacy on the part of the director and the writer to make it work, but I think it could certainly could happen, and there are examples of it. Uh, um, uh, especially, it, it especially has to do with something we've mentioned before, and I think you mentioned in an earlier class, Susanna, which is that you can create a sense of expansiveness if you photograph in depth, if you go back and forth. What you can't do is try to create a primary, uh, 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 an exterior, an external, an outdoor drama that runs horizontally across the screen because the space is too small for that. And, it, and you have a sense of how arbitrarily constricted it is in comparison to what happens when you watch the movies. And so, of course, there are ways to do it. And another thing that's involved, which comes out in the Jansen episode that we just looked at, uh, or the fragment of the episode, is that camera placement is very important. Not simply the physical environment, but the way the camera is placed in relation to the action can often be a, a critical factor. One last comment, and then we'll shift over to another clip. Yes. Um, when you asked well, where, do, where does the you asked the question where does the action take place and the, the the response I wanted to give actually was on David Jansen's face, um, in that what part of what's interesting about the scene is that because the camera spends so much time dwelling on Kimball's facial expressions, every little twitch that he has and every every sort of every fidget every like the decision to look between the two cops actually has some meaning. Yes. And and the creepy thing is that the guy right next to him, uh, uh, the 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 the. I forgot what what his name Harry is. I should mention him. Yeah, he is. He just all of his expressions seem to just sort of his face seems to melt into one expression and then seems to melt into the next. And there's this kind of they, their faces react so very differently. Uh, and the one the one looks kind of unnatural and, and a sort of stagey effect. Whereas David, I mean, this kind of acting just wouldn't it wouldn't go over in a theater unless the theater were six people sitting in front of the stage. Um, and it wouldn't it would work it would work very differently on a film, for instance. And so in this in this environment. Every, every nuance of his facial expression, he has to be doing a kind of acting that right. had never been called for before, but also I mean, they, they know how to take advantage of that. And, and this, this drama, one of the things we might say is that one of the things we're, that Wally's pointing attention to is what we might, I don't know if I should actually use the word genre to describe what I want to um, point to, because it's not in the, narrowest, in, the, in the narrow sense truly a genre, but one of the things that Wally's comments remind us of is the extent to which virtually all television programs create or gravitate toward a drama of the face, a drama of the close-up. So whether we're talking about All in the Family or The Fugitive or NYPD Blue, what we find is that the moments of, the moments of crisis and complexity on these programs are not universally, not always, but are or very often moments that involve relative close-ups in which facial expression uh, changes in facial expression, uh, uh, the, the almost impossible to describe ways in which one's eyes can register meaning are exploited and explored. And I mean, one, one of the problems that this presents to someone trying to comment on the medium is the, the area of criticism that is least well developed is, is the area of performance criticism, how you describe and evaluate an actor and what, 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 what a performance involves and how you name the different parts of a performance remains a relatively underdeveloped area for uh, critical discourse for obvious reasons. Uh, 
but but it's but it's a crucial matter for understanding television. There's a certain kind of performance, a kind of uh, a kind of nuanced and uh, uh, unphysical forms of performance that have to do with voice and and uh, uh, the shape of one's eyebrows and the way and the expression on in one's eyes and so forth becomes a seminal subgenre. Right, the drama of the face on American on American television. Well, let me. Uh, so, so part of the reason that I showed you this then was to remind you of the fact that there is significant um, complexity, even relatively early in the in the medium's history, and one could go back into the 50s and, and find some examples of this as well. In other words, we don't want the historical model I'm offering you to be so oversimplified that we fall into the delusion of imagining that it's only after 1970 that good television appears. Not quite that. We're not saying that. We're saying something much uh, less reductive than that, that on balance, right? That the vast majority of the programs get better, that, uh, uh, that the range of subject matter enlarges, that the programs become technically better in general over, 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 this, over this evolution. But not that there can't be, even in the very earliest moments, remarkable and memorable achievements, which is one reason I wanted to emphasize the honeymooners at an earlier part of the program, because I think if we made a, a list of, you know, a hall of fame of television programs, the honeymooners would be one of the first nominees. Okay, so now let me show you something else. Uh, to, to dramatize, now we'll move back to what, where we chronologically have reached in our, in our argument to the, to the 70s. Um, um, and I'd like to show you a fragment of a program. I, I, I hope, oh, it may not be. I'd like to show you a fragment of a program. And I may have to, I may have to back it up slightly, so bear with me. Uh, and I want you to see if you can tell me, hopefully you won't be able to see this, what, come on machine, yes, but it was a mistake, it's, I think this is what I want, no, that's not Gene Hack. Character who looks a little like him. All right, this is the, this is where the scene begins. Get you to bed. I did. Where you been? Just walking. What's wrong? Are you awake enough? Sure. This is a father and a daughter. Marsha, there isn't going to be enough money to send you to Costa Rica. An anthropology fellowship that she was hoping for. What happened? The depart. Revoke permission on my outside job because of a conflict of interest. I could have had a full-time job with Jerry Pearl and quit the department. I tried to hang on to both jobs. I gambled. I shot crap with your future and I lost. Don't put yourself down. I'm not, it's what is. When's the last time you bought yourself a new suit? The hell does that have to do with anything? It has to do with the fact that there's no money. And you have the right to live the kind of life you want to live. You have the right to do what kind of work that's meaningful to you. 
I know what it's like. I know what it's like for you when the case starts to come together. You, you get quiet and I can hear you buzzing inside. It's a high. You grew up into a real perceptive young lady. That makes me happier than I could say. <laughs> but I'm disappointed in myself. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a sucker for father-daughter scenes. She reminds me a little of my daughter, although my daughter's much more beautiful. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you a question about that scene. What kind of a, what genre does this scene come from? What, 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 what if, I, if you had to guess, could you tell? I, mean, I don't think you can actually tell, but where do you, th what, what, what sort of a, this is from a television series of the 70s. Susanna knows. <laughs> no, I was going to give the, the answer which you're trying to elicit, I, I, which is that if, if you wanted to classify this one scene into a genre, it would be something like family drama yes. or melodrama, though I think it was well yes, performed. Yes, some, kind of some kind of domestic melodrama, right. Uh, and, 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 and of course, it, I don't know if you'll actually be able to tell from the end unless you remember the program, which had a very distinctive ending. I'll let it play to the end. <laughs> Unit repeat. 11 Mary 6, call a station. 13 Zebra 5, John Frank William 899. 8839, no water warrant, Roger. Trinum 88, 388, see the woman, a 415 site, 2701. All right. It's a cop show. That's, that's the Michael Mann who's the director. Yes. Um, Michael Mann was very. This this program was called. It was, was the precursor of the great cop shows of the seven, of the of, of the later period of, of of the 80s and beyond. Uh, it was a show called Police Story, and what, I mean I think it's a very moving um, human scene between a father and a daughter. But I'm to, what, and you're right, of course, Susanna, that I was trying to elicit such a response. What I was trying to dramatize was exactly the point that I had made a bit earlier about the way in which one tendency of television is to. Uh, because of the nature of the medium, uh, uh, in part, uh, is to move toward a kind of almost uh, trans-generic treatment of, intim of intimate scenery, of intimate scenes, of, of dramatic interactions between a relatively small number of characters, a reliance on close-ups, uh, and, and most of all, uh, a, a reliance on what we might think of as a, a drama of the emotions, a melodramatic kind of, a melodrama kind of, kind of tendency. Uh, and the, the, the fact is that, that this cop show police story dealt with the ordinary kinds of subjects that, that um, uh, police dramas on television have always done with urban crime and with variations on, on uh, um, the problem of, of, of keeping order in a complex city. I think P police story was, I think, set in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, it didn't have recurring characters, however, and, and it, had, it, had, it had something of the, of the psychological and audiovisual complexity of programs that came as much as a decade later. The point about this scene, however, is that it might very well have been taken from a domestic melodrama, from a medical show. You really can't tell what genre it belongs to. And uh, it's a particularly dramatic uh, uh, piece of evidence for the notion that the drama of the face and the drama of human interaction is at the heart of what television fiction does regardless of what drama it's in. Not that there aren't variations among the genres, but that, but that the tendency of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the broader category, that the broadest category we might call television fiction, is to move towards scenes of this sort because it's what the medium is capable of doing best. It's what the medium is most powerful at, at uh, dramatizing. Uh, you might, did any of you recognize the actor? Yeah, I mean, he's an interesting link between the movies and television. His, 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 he had a distinguished career as a child actor in the movies, named Jackie Cooper. And he was a very famous child actor 
then had a minor career as an adult actor, and then when television came around, became a, uh, a, a, a relatively successful director and actor on American television. I, mean, I, I think this is a, his greatest role on American television, this, sing, this episode of, of a Police Story. Well, w let me remind you where we, st where we, where we stand now. Uh, we're sort of into the uh, mature period of American television. Uh, I, I, I fell one episode short of what, one clip short of what I wanted to do for today, so I'll pick up with that clip next time. And what, what we're going to do now is, is begin to explore in a more systematic way certain aspects of specific genres that we haven't had a chance to talk about. We'll begin, uh, uh, we'll begin by, by saying some things about situation comedy, and I'll show you a fragment of a situation comedy to sort of start the discourse, a fragment of the Mary Tyler Moore show to start the discourse. And then, so, so start thinking about situation comedy in a systematic way, your experience of older and contemporary situation comedy in our, our class on next Tuesday, when I hope we will finally have all your papers ready, uh, will be devoted to that.